Hey team, Jack here. So in the previous video, I covered some of the early things that neutrophils do, such as phagocytosis and cytokine release. And in this one, I'm going to take through their major thing. We're really going to get to the guts of what neutrophils are about. And that is netosis and degranulation. So let's jump into it. So we've covered phagocytosis and cytokine release. Now we're going to jump into netosis. So netosis stands for neutrophil extracellular traps, and it's got that osis part on the end of the word because it's, it's a form of cell death typically, like apoptosis, necrosis, pyroptosis. These are all forms of cell death, and so we've got netosis. Now it's called netosis because it's an extracellular trap. It's the DNA of the neutrophil coming out and trapping the pathogen um, like a net. So it's a really cool term. And in this little gif here, we've actually got my neutrophils. These are my neutrophils. And in the blue, we've stained the DNA. So let's just watch what happens going around. So we see here's our neutrophils. And we've got these little blue dots where the nuclei are. Then we'll see that the blue spreads throughout the cell. And then the cell just pops. It's amazing. It just pops. And what we can't see, because the DNA becomes a bit dilute, we can't see that now there's a massive um, ring of DNA here. That's netosis. Now, why would you do this? It seems like suicide, and it is, but I'm gonna take you through the steps of netosis so hopefully you can understand why we do it. Here's a picture of it here. Now they've fluorescently labeled the DNA here, and we can see in red these beautiful DNA nets that are spread out throughout the tissue. And these nets are literally gonna physically restrain the spread of viruses, bacteria, and fungi. So it allows the physical containment of pathogens. But it does more than that. So what happens is, before the neutrophils release their DNA, they merge the granules. You know, those granules that contain those bacterial bactericidal, pathogen-killing compounds. They merge the granules with the neutrophils. And what happens is the DNA now becomes laced with the bacterial bactericidal and pathogen-killing proteins that are found in the granules will now be attached and laced onto the DNA. Now we need sustained inflammatory signaling for netosis to happen. It's not a quick response. It takes um, a few hours up to a day. That video you actually saw was 12 hours of my neutrophils for netosis to occur. But And that's because the neutrophil wants to try other mechanisms like phagocytosis before it goes into killing itself, right? It wants to try a non-fatal method before it goes into killing itself. So the um, the phagosomes uh, fuse with the, uh, the nucleus, sorry, the granules fuse with the nucleus and those pathogen killing compounds then bind to the DNA. Now we get lysis of the nucleus, so that DNA spreads throughout the cell, and we saw that in that little gif. Then we get holes punched in the membranes by neutrophil proteins that we're going to cover, and the DNA just spreads out and, and surrounds the pathogen, and so now it's got both the physical containment from the DNA as well as the pathogen-killing enzymes, killing the pathogens within the net, which is very cool. Now this is called suicidal netosis but there's another kind of netosis, which may be even cooler, and it's called vital netosis. And in this one, the neutrophil survives, kind of. So um, we still get the granules fusing with the nucleus, and then we get the nucleus fusing with the outer membrane and outspits the DNA. So the DNA is now ejected from the cell where it can go do the same thing. It can trap the pathogens and kill it with the pathogen-killing enzymes attached to the DNA that came from the granules. But now, and research has shown, that the neutrophils that now do not have nuclei can maintain themselves for several hours while they go hunt and phagocytose and kill other pathogens. It's insane. This cell has no nucleus, and it's hunting and killing pathogens. Very cool. So that, that suicidal netosis is when the cell pops itself, and vital netosis is when the cell survives for several hours after it's ejected its nucleus. It's still going to die. It's got no nucleus, but it can just function like a zombie a little bit for a while without its nuclei. So those are the two kinds of netosis. How does it pop? How does it pop itself is an interesting question. Um, and it actually works very similarly to how natural killer cells um, kill cells with 
porphyrin, perforin, and T cells kill cells as well using perforin, which is a protein that oligomerizes in the membrane, creating a pore in that membrane. Now, neutrophils do this, but it uses a different protein. It's called gastermin D. Now, gastermin D has an N-terminal domain that is a pore-forming protein and a C-terminal domain that inhibits the activity of the N-terminal domain. And what we need for this to be activated is cleavage. We need it to be cut in two. So now you've got the pore-forming N-terminal domain ready to go create that pore. Now, this cleavage in a neutrophil can be caused by neutrophil elastase, which is the protease found in granules. So in order for a neutrophil to undergo netosis, once the um, DNA laced with neutrophil elastase is released into the cytosol, it will cleave gastermin D. The neutrophil elastase will cleave gastermin D, freeing up the pore-forming terminal of the uh, end domain, pore-forming in terminal domain, which will then insert itself into a membrane and oligomerize into this beautiful shape here, creating a hole in the membrane, which eventually just pops it like a water balloon. Um, here's some scanning electron uh, microscopy looking down on a membrane, and here you can see the gas dermin D uh, pore forming structures forming in that membrane. It's so cool. So cool. So that's netosis. And look, now that I've explained it, let's watch this GIF again. So this is my neutrophil. You can see the DNA has spread throughout the cell. Gastermin D has inserted itself into the membrane. And then, wait for it, pop. You can see the cells pop. I'm going to watch it one more time because it's so cool. This is netosis. So imagine, so these neutrophils are actually surrounded by bacteria. They're quite hard to see in this image. Um, so here we've got a neutrophil. Here's the nuclei. You can see the DNA is spread and then pop. That's netosis. So now let's go to degranulation. Now this is where the rubber meets the road when it comes to a neutrophil. This is the bread and butter of the neutrophil. They release their granules to kill all the pathogens in the extracellular space. Now, not all granules are the same. The neutrophil actually has three main kinds of granules, primary, secondary, and tertiary. Now their roles dramatically overlap. Um, so this is why it's drawn in this sort of Venn diagram format, but roughly this is their main specialization. The primary granules are pathogen killing. The secondary granules contain pathogen starving compounds, so a compound that will starve the pathogens that are attempting to grow. And the tertiary granules is involved in cell migration. So let's jump into those granules. Primary granules, right? So this is, you know, this is the this is what neutrophils do. Um, they have a receptor on their cell surface that can be activated by interleukin-8. Now, when interleukin-8 is activated, we get calcium influx. So calcium is normally high outside the cell and low inside the cell. And when the calcium flushes in, that signals for the vesicle to fuse, all the granules to fuse with the outer membrane. So the calcium rushing in is what causes the fusion of the granules to the membrane. Now, in these granules are proteases, like neutrophil elastase and cathepsin. And these just chop up a huge number of proteins. They're quite nonspecific, and they just chop hundreds and hundreds of different kinds of proteins. Proteins are essential for pathogen functioning. You know, maybe it's a viral capsid that's getting digested by the neutrophil elastase. Um, those proteases are just going to kill those pathogens by chopping up all the proteins that they need to function. Um, but another function is the production of bleach. And this is chemically identical to household bleach. And this sterilizes the area. Bleach is very reactive. And the chemical formula of biological compounds dictates its function. So if you just randomly react um, hypochlorous acid to your compounds, you're going to prevent its function. So if the bleach reacts with a lipid from the uh, envelope of a virus, that lipid is now not going to function as a barrier anymore, and you're going to get diffusion, and, um, and it's not going to work essentially as a barrier, which is its main role. So now the virus loses its compartment, and now it can't get into a cell, right? So um, bleach is very reactive, changes the chemical formula of biological compounds, thus they don't work anymore. Now, there isn't bleach in the granules. 
um, there is an enzyme called MPO, myeloperoxidase, and that enzyme produces bleach. You cannot contain bleach. It's too reactive. It's like the Hulk. You cannot contain it. So you need to produce it where and when you need it. So in the granules is the enzyme that produces the bleach, not the bleach itself. Now, just to prove to you that this is, those um, enzymes are essential to uh, are, are essential to killing pathogens. In this experiment, they took they took micro uh, they took neutrophils and they put them on two different pathogens: a uh, fungus here, C. albicans, and Staph aureus here, a bacteria. So they put the neutrophils on, but the neutrophils they got from mice that they genetically engineered. So um, in pink, we have a normal mouse. So here we can see a normal mouse can kill most of the fungus very quickly and almost all the bacteria very quickly. So in the pink, normal neutrophils, percentage viable, we can see the bacteria just die instantly because the neutrophils are killing it. Now, um, we've got two special, special mice here. In, in the blue, we've knocked out neutrophil elastase. So in the blue here, these neutrophils do not contain neutrophil elastase. They can still kill bacteria okay, nowhere near as good as the wild type, but okay, but they can't kill the fungus at all. So obviously this fungus is very susceptible to neutrophil elastase. Another protease called cathepsin G, um, if you knock that out, that's in purple, you cannot kill the bacteria at all without cathepsin G. Um, you can slightly kill the fungus um, without cathepsin G, um, but you're not as good as the wild type. And in green, we've got the double knockout. So in the green, they're missing both cathepsin G and neutrophil elastase. And you can see in both groups, the green cannot kill either of the pathogens. So the green uh, neutrophils, the neutrophils extracted from mice that lack neutrophil elastase and cathepsin G cannot kill either of these pathogens. So these enzymes are essential to the pathogen killing abilities of neutrophils. But there's another interesting role, and this is why there's a lot of overlap in that Venn diagram here. So this here is again, a mouse that's been genetically engineered to not have neutrophil elastase. So it's knocked out that gene, there's no neutrophil elastase. They looked at the ability for neutrophils to leave the blood vessel and get into the tissue. So they injected prostaglandins, which are an inflammatory signaling molecule, and you see this massive influx of neutrophils. But if you knock out neutrophil elastase, the neutrophils can't get out of the blood vessel. Why is that? Well, the neutrophils actually help break down the bonds between the uh, endothelial cells and the fibrous tissue after the blood vessel, so they can actually get through the tissue and the blood vessel. They need to digest a bit of the host proteins, your proteins, they're going to digest to get the neutrophil into the tissue. So neutrophil elastase kills pathogens, but it's also a little bit involved in neutrophil migration. Secondary Granules, um, they're famous for containing this protein called lactoferrin. Now it's called lactoferrin because we found it in milk. So that's where the lacto comes in. And it's called ferrin because it binds to iron, which is ferrous here. Here's a, um, uh, I'm pretty sure it's probably Latin, I don't know, for iron. I wish I knew that now. Um, but yeah, so whenever you see Fear that relates to iron. So lactoferrin is an iron binding protein. So what it does is it snaffles up all the free iron in the extracellular space and pathogens like fungus and bacteria need that iron to divide, right? They're quite metabolically active. It's, a, it's an essential nutrient. So if you soak up all the iron, then the bacteria can't grow. Um, so by soaking it up, uh, you, you are preventing bacterial growth. So that you're starving it. So secondary granules starve the pathogens. Lactoferrin, again, this is all because of overlap, does an, a few other things. It also digests up um, RNA, so it can help you get rid of RNA viruses. Um, and it also coats um, the surface of the cell and the surface of the pathogen, helping prevent pathogens getting inside the cell. So it does a number of things, but the, its major, major role is that soaking up of the iron. And then finally, we have tertiary granules. Now, tertiary granules contain gelatinase, which comes from gelatin, and that's where we get the word jelly from. Now, gelatin 
is essentially just collagen and extracellular matrix compounds. And we create it by, this might be upsetting, this is a gelatin plant and those are animal carcasses. So we take the skin, the bones, the joints, anything that's not meat, um, we take from the animal and we boil it up and it dissolves up the extracellular matrix that is still attached and the fibrous collagen and in the, in the ligaments and tendons of these carcasses. And then we turn the jelly into lollies um, and we turn that gelatin into lollies and jelly and find it in a delicious dessert. But honestly, just don't think about it because lollies are delicious. Just don't think about bulldozers with animal carcasses when you think about jelly. But anyway, so uh, in the tertiary granules are gelatinases, which are enzymes that digest gelatin or digest jelly or digest collagen is a way to think about it. So here, um, this is just a test, for example, um, we've got two tubes that have been filled up with jelly. Collagen, honestly, it's just jelly. Um, it's scientific jelly, but it is exactly the same as jelly. And then you uh, put on, you could put on neutrophils, for example, to see if the neutrophil, when they degranulate, do they release an enzyme that breaks down that jelly. So in A, we can see that we've got this gelatinase, and in B, we do not have that enzyme present because the jelly is still rigid. So you can see this has become fluid because the gelatin, the collagen, has been digested up, and so now it's turned into a fluid, whereas this one we can see is still solid. And um, gelatinase is the general term for all the enzymes that do this, and one really good example is MMP9. Um, so let's have a look at what happens if you genetically knock out MMP9, the gelatinase, um, in a mouse. And what we see is this is um, how many neutrophils we find in the lungs of mice that have been infected with influenza. And what we can see is when you knock out that gelatinase, you, lock, you knock out the ability of neutrophils to migrate into the tissue. So you lower the number of neutrophils that have migrated in. And this is the primary role of the tertiary granule, is it helps the neutrophil get through the tissue. And this is because we always draw tissue like that, cells very spaced out, and there's lots of room for a neutrophil to come in and wiggle around. But that's not what tissue looks like. This is a liver. Here we've got some healthy liver here. You can see those cells up the top here, it's healthy. You can see all those cells are packed in super tight. I just, ooh, yeah. Um, are packed in super tight up in this top left here. And here we've got these neutrophils that have come in from the blood, um, from the blood, oh boy, from the blood supply, from the arteries and venules and capillaries, we've got neutrophils streaming into the tissue and they're trying to get out to the sites of infection and tissue damage. And it's difficult. They've got to push through this tissue that's full of extracellular matrix and it's packed with cells. So how do you do that? Well, you need to digest the extracellular matrix. You need to digest down the collagen and um, in, in the fibro, fibrinogen in the extracellular matrix. You need to break that down so the neutrophil can now get in between the cells and get to where it wants to go. And that's what tertiary granules are for. They essentially liquefy your extracellular space to allow the neutrophil go through the tissue. Right, so we've taken you through phagocytosis, a primary role of pathogen killing for the neutrophil, cytokine release, which isn't a major role, but they certainly can do it. Netosis is one of the last resorts of the neutrophil, should the pathogen really get out of hand, where they spew out their DNA to control the pathogens. And degranulation, which is the bread and butter of the neutrophil, which they release their granules in order to migrate through the tissue, starve the pathogen, and then kill the pathogen with pathogen acidal compounds such as neutrophil elastase, cathepsin G and MPO. Thank you for joining me. Um, in the next video we're going to cover what neutrophils do in SARS-CoV-2.